Hello everyone, and welcome back to IRL Lore. The Sagovax here, telling the tale of the Sumero-Akkadian Anthropogenesis. That is to say, some of the earliest surviving records of humanity's origins. We will be looking at segments from three texts, the first two set the stage somewhat, from which I'm taking excerpts to help establish the context of the main one, the Atrahashish epic. Atrahashish? Ha hashish? I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Uh, which I will be covering the first part of here today. Both of the former are on the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature, if you want to check the full things for further context. It's an invaluable resource, and I'd advise you to read everything on the site for maximum context. Links below. We start our first text by setting the stage with an introduction of the most wise among gods, Anki. So let's begin. Anki and the World Order. Grandiloquent lord of heaven and earth, self-reliant, father Anki, engendered by a bull, begotten by a wild bull, cherished by Enlil, the great mountain, beloved by holy An, king, Mestri, planted in the Absu, rising over all lands, great dragon who stands in Erdug, whose shadow covers heaven and earth, a grove of vines extending over the land, Anki, lord of plenty of the Anuna gods, Nudimud, mighty one of the Ekur, Strong one of heaven and earth, your great house is founded in the Abzu, the great mooring post of heaven and earth. Anki, from whom a single glance is enough to unsettle the heart of the mountains, wherever bison are born, where stags are born, where ibex are born, where wild goats are born, in meadows, lacuna, in hollows, in hollows in the heart of the hills, in green, lacuna unvisited by man, you have fixed your gaze on the heart of the land, like a hall hall reed. Counting the days, and putting the months in their houses, so as to complete the year, and to submit the completed years to the assembly for a decision, taking decisions to regularize the day. So there, at the end, from about lines 15 to 25, we get the context obliquely revealed to us. Enki and some wild animals, in the Abzu, on a green earth unvisited by man, and Mr. Smarty Pants first starts to determine the days and seasons of the year on this planet. It then goes on at length, extolling Anki's fertility and skill in bringing forth all manner of flora and fauna in abundance. Probably not that difficult, unlike an untapped primal world. I mean, speaking of, you ever play Far Cry Primal? I imagine it's not far off from reality, just constant storm of claws and fangs and a lot of wildlife. Anyhow, the text regains some more consequence, I think, around line 89. At my command, sheepfolds have been built, cow pens have been fenced off. When I approach heaven, a rain of abundance rains from heaven. When I approach earth, there is a high carp flood. When I approach the green meadows, at my word, stockpiles and stacks are accumulated. I have built my house, a shrine, in a pure place, and named it with a good name. I have built my Abzu, a shrine in Lacuna, and decreed a good fate for it. The shade of my house extends over the Lacuna, pool. By my house the Suher carp dart among the honey plants, and the Ektub carp wave their tails among the small geese reeds. The small birds chirp in their nests. The Lord's Lacuna to me, I am Anki. They stand before me, praising me, the Abgal priests, and the Abrig officials, who, sta who Lacuna stand before me, Lacuna distant days. The Encom and Ninkum officiants organize, Lacuna they purify the river for me, they Lacuna, the interior of the shrine for me. In my Abzu, sacred songs and incantations resound for me, my barge, crown, the stag of the Abzu transports me there most delightfully. It glides swiftly for me through the great marshes, to wherever I have decided. It is obedient to me. The stroke callers make the oars pull in perfect unison. So, after charting the calendar, Anki sets to work, and it almost seems to be describing some light terraforming efforts, assuming that's not already what he was doing with the previous description of his Fertility, agility, ability. God. <laughs> Anyways, he established a home 
Gardens were established, canals were cleared and purified, and it even describes him boating around. Or maybe to put, put it a different way, then, on the seventh day, God tore up the bayou in his fan boat. Naturally, I jest. Nothing is being created here. Anki is establishing this useful stuff that goes along with it, but the planet itself is already there. Anki is not formed in this tale. He's already a serious genius well-versed in science and magic. The major thing this text seems to be telling us is the story of how the Lofty Ones first established permanent bases here. The start of Earth mission by some intrepid ancient explorer, one of our forefathers. Which that last part is not my crazy ancient astronaut theory, that's how the Sumerians and most pagan cultures viewed themselves as descendants of the gods. Why? Is for you to decide what you think about why, but hear me out on the rest of this first, please. Next up we have a text called Enlil in the e Kur. Let's just jump in. Enlil's commands are by far the loftiest. His words are holy. His utterances are immutable. The fate he decides is everlasting. His glance makes the mountains anxious. His lacuna reaches into the, mountain, into the interior of the mountains. All the gods of the earth bow down to Father Enlil, who sits comfortably on the holy dais, the lofty dais, to Nunamnir, whose lordship and princeship are most perfect. The Anuna gods enter before him and obey his instructions faithfully. The mighty lord, the greatest in heaven and earth, the knowledgeable judge, the wise one of wide-ranging wide wisdom, has taken his seat in the Duran Key and made the key Ur, the great place resplendent with majesty. He has taken up residence in Nibru, the lofty bond between heaven and earth. The front of the city is laden with terrible fearsomeness and radiance. Its back is such that even the mightiest god does not dare attack, and its interior, interior is the blade of a sharp dagger, a blade of catastrophe. For the rebel lands, it is a snare, a trap, a net. It cuts short the life of those who speak too mightily. It permits no evil word to be spoken in judgment. Lacuna, deception, inimical speech, hostility, impropriety, ill-treatment, wickedness, wrongdoing, looking askance, violence, slandering, arrogance, licentious speech, egotism, and boasting are abominations not tolerated within the city. The borders of Nibru form a great net, within which the Hurin eagle spreads wide its talons. The evil or wicked man does not escape its grasp. In this city, endowed with steadfastness, for which righteousness and justice have been made a lasting possession, and which is clothed in pure clothing on the quay, the younger brother honors the older brother, and treats him with human dignity. People pay attention to a father's word, and submit themselves to his protection. The child behaves humbly and modestly towards his mother, and attains a ripe old age. In the city, the holy settlement of Enlil, in Nibru, the beloved shrine of Father, Great Mountain, he has made the dais of abundance. The Ikur, the shining temple, rise from the soil. He has made it grow on pure land, as high as a towering mountain. Its prince, the Great Mountain, Father Enlil has taken his seat on the dais of the Ikur, the lofty shrine. No god can cause harm to the temple's divine powers. Its holy hand-washing rites are everlasting like the earth. Its divine powers are the divine powers of the Abzu. No one can look upon them. Its interior is a wide sea, which knows no horizon, its lacuna glistening as a banner. The bonds and ancient divine powers are made perfect. Its words are prayers, its incantations are supplications, its word is a favorable omen, lacuna. Its rites are most precious. At the festivals there is plenty of fat and cream. They are full of abundance. Its divine plans bring joy and rejoicing. Its verdicts are great. Daily there is a great festival, and at the end of the day there is an abundant harvest. The temple of Enlil is a mountain of abundance. To reach out, to look with greedy eyes, to seize, are abominations in it. The Lagar priests of this temple, whose lord has grown together with it, are expert in blessing. Its Gudu priests of the Abzu are suited for lustration rites. Its Nuek priests are perfect in the holy prayers. Its farmer is the good shepherd of the Lord, who was born vigorous on a, propiti on a propitious day. The farmer, suited for the broad fields, comes with rich offerings. 
he does not lacuna into the shining e cur. And Leal, when you marked out the holy settlements, you also built Nibru, your own city, you lacuna the key ur, the mountain, your pure place, you founded it in the Duran Key, in the middle of the four quarters of the earth. So, I know that was kind of at length, I just let the text speak for itself there. And I think the contrast, contrast with the previous one is pretty clear. It may still be early in their settlement, but Enlil is firmly in charge now. Where in the last text, Anki was decreeing fates, saying where cities would be, here now we see Enlil, armored in a whole city, bristling with fearsome weapons. Stark contrast to Anki just beginning, setting up his little science outpost. Line 109. Without the great mountain, Enlil, no city would be built, no settlement would be founded, no cow pen would be built, no sheepfold would be established, no king would be elevated, no lord would be given birth, no high priest or priestess would perform ecstasy. Soldiers would have no generals or captains. Now command is here. Before, it was just curiosity, but now we have a job to do. And Leal says the sheepfolds and cowpens Anki built could not have been built without him and Leal, which seems to me like a typical conflation used by tyrants. The government gives you permission to do it, and maybe even a tax break to help you do it. Therefore, the government did it. Oh, you don't like being a de facto peasant tenant due to property taxes funding government indoctrination? Hmm, you must just hate all education arbitrarily then, huh? Like, that kind of thing. Kingship is here on earth now, but I'm, I'm getting off topic. Now the stage is set. The magic dudes from the sky have come down to earth. First the wise snake Anki, second the strong bull Enlil. Now we begin... The Atrahashish Epic. When the gods were as man, they did forced labor. They bore drudgery. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. The forced labor was heavy. The misery too much. The seven great Anuna gods were burdening the Agigi gods with forced labor, lacuna. The gods were digging watercourses, canals they opened, the life of the land. The Agigi gods were digging watercourses, canals they opened, the life of the land. The Agigi gods dug the Tigris River and the Euphrates thereafter. Springs they opened from the depths. Wells, lacuna, they established. Lacuna, they heaped up mountains. Several lines lost to a lacuna. Line 34, lacuna, years of drudgery. So, recall the distinction between Anunnaki and Igigi. An, meaning heavenly. Ki, meaning earth. Anunnaki is, controversially, translated as those who from heaven to earth came. Well, Igi, meaning I, and Gi, a very similar pictogram to Ki and with similar connotations, also denoting Earth. I'm not sure what semantic difference is supposed to be there exactly, but I've always thought perhaps it's something like the conceptual difference between Earth, the planet, and Earth, like the stuff you can take a handful of. Are these astronauts set to work on planet-side projects? And... Not just any projects, either. Hard labor on a planet that's probably lousy with, like, saber tooths and stuff. Naturally, resentment builds. Line 35. Lacuna, the vast marsh. They counted years of drudgery. Lacuna, and forty years. Too much. Lacuna, forced labor. They bore night and day. They were complaining, denouncing, muttering down in the ditch. Let us face up to our foreman, the prefect. He must take off our heavy burden upon us. And Leal, counselor of the gods, the warrior, come, let us remove him from his dwelling. And Leal, counselor of the gods, the warrior, come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Several lines missing. Now them, call for battle. Battle let us join. Warfare. The gods heard his words. They set fire to their tools. They put fire to their spaces and flame to their work baskets. Off they went, one and all, to the gate of the warrior and Leal's abode. It was night, halfway through the watch. The house was surrounded, but the god did not know. It was night, halfway through the watch. Iker was surrounded, but Enlil did not know. Several lines missing. The great god send a messenger. Line 132. Nusku opened his gate, took his weapons, and went, Lacuna, Enlil, in the assembly of all the gods. He knelt, stood up, and expounded the command. 
Anu, your father, your counselor, the warrior Enlil, your prefect Ninurta, and your bailiff Enugi, have sent me to say, Who is the instigator of this battle? Who is the instigator of these hostilities? Who declared war? That battle has run up to the gate of Enlil, in Lacuna. He transgressed the command of Enlil. Every one of us gods have declared war. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! Lacuna. We have set Lacuna the excavation. Excessive drudgery has killed us. Our forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. Now every one of us gods has resolved on a reckoning with Enlil. End of tablet. Just an aside, but both the vizier Nusku and the bailiff Anugi will reappear later in other texts. I think, doesn't Nusku show up in Zoo? I think so, but I can't remember, and I don't feel like double-checking right now. Point is, there's a consistent, coherent narrative running between these texts, and the more you start to see it, the harder you will sh uh, defecate masonry. And do you think Enugi could be the original Eastern Semitic form of the name we later see in the Western Semitic tradition as Enoch? Because if you think about it, it fits here roughly in point of timeline and his station among the divines and just, hmm, maybe video for another time. We pick back up in the next tablet, recounting a council of the gods discussing a solution to the crisis. Ea made ready to speak, and said to the gods his brothers, What calumny do we lay to their charge? Their forced labor was heavy, their misery too much. Every day, Lacuna, the outcry was loud. We could hear the clamor. There is Lacuna, Belet Illy, the midwife, is present. Let her create, then, a human, a man. Let him bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. Belit Illy, the midwife, is present. Let the midwife create a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. They summoned and asked the goddess, the midwife of the god, what god's wise mommy, Will you be the birth goddess, creatress of mankind? Create a human being that he bear the yoke? Let him bear the yoke, the task of Enlil? Let man assume the drudgery of the god? Nin too made ready to speak, and said to the great gods, It is not for me to do it. The task is Anki's. He it is that cleanses all. Let him provide me the clay, so I can do the making. Now, let's consider what we know of Anki, his primacy as a scientist, particularly biologist, and his special familiarity with earthling fauna as probably the first scientist there, here. Perhaps there's a reason to go to him as the source for this quote-unquote clay. I won't quibble too much over the translation, though there are arguments to be made. Instead, I will simply ask you to notice what is being made using one, the blood of the gods, and two, the clay of this world. Moving on. Enki made ready to speak, and said to the great gods, On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, let me establish a purification, a bath. Let one god be slaughtered, then let the gods be cleansed by immersion. Let Nintu mix the clay with his flesh and blood. Let that same god and man be thoroughly mixed in the clay. Let us hear the drum for the rest of time. From the flesh, the god, from the flesh of the god, let a spirit remain. Let it make the living know its sign. Lest he be allowed to be forgotten, let the spirit remain. The great Anuna gods who administer destinies answered, Yes, in the assembly. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, he established purification, a bath. They slaughtered Ao Ilu, who had the inspiration in their assembly. Nintu mixed the clay with his flesh and blood. That same god and man were thoroughly mixed in the clay. For the rest of time, they would hear the drum. From the flesh of the god, the spirit remained. It would make the living know its sign. Lest he be allowed to be forgotten, the spirit remained. After she had mixed the clay, she summoned the Anuna, the great gods, the Agigi, the great gods spat upon the clay. Mommy made ready to speak, and said to the great gods, You ordered me the task, and I have completed it. You have slaughtered the god, along with his inspiration. I have done away with your heavy forced labor. I have imposed your drudgery on man. You have bestowed clamor upon mankind. I have released the yoke. I have made restoration. Lest he be allowed to be forgotten, the spirit remained.
After she had mixed the clay, she summoned the Anuna, the great gods, the Igigi, the great gods, spat upon the clay. Mami made ready to speak, and said to the gods, You ordered me the task, and I have completed it. You have slaughtered the god along with his inspiration. I have done away with your heavy forced labor. I have imposed your drudgery on man. You have bestowed clamor upon mankind. I have released the yoke. I have made restoration. They heard this speech of hers. They ran, free of care, and kissed her feet, saying, Formerly we used to call you Mami. Now let your name be Belet Kala Ili, meaning mistress of all gods. And so thus, we, the black-headed people, are created. What precisely is trying to be described here? The talk of taking blood, purifying baths, and the imparting of a sign. It almost sounds medical to me. And the first, seventh, and fifteenth days, what's their significance? I can't help but notice that it fits within the time frame of a menstrual cycle. You probably see where I'm going with this. In vitro fertilization. But ironically, I'm sure that the same over-educated and over-socialized soy jacks who would probably need to rely on IVF are going to come along to tell me that it's physically impossible, but only when our ancestors describe it. That's the end of Atrahashish for now. There's more to the text, but I'll hit that up when I do a dedicated video on the deluge. Finally, we will round things out with some good old Genesis. It seems like Enuma Elish and everything I've just read today get the last time on Dragon Ball Z treatment in Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 27. Then, weirdly, immediately after in chapter 2 verse 7, it describes God making man again. I'm not sure why, I've always interpreted it as incorporating elements of multiple con contributing sources into the biblical version, some of which we may have even read on this channel. What's more interesting to me is the next verse, though. The very next verse, uh, 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Eastward from where? The Bible doesn't say, but I think we can guess from the Sumerian sources it would be in Enki's domain, the Absu, Africa. And you'd have to go east to get to Eden from there, assuming Eden is in Mesopotamia, and the word Eden has always sounded very sumerian e, but that's just to me, that's my, my opinion. I won't bore you with the biblical account of the subsequent events that everyone already knows, and for which we sadly lack any sort of Sumero-Akkadian original to compare it with. It either did not survive the great filter of our violent history together on this world, or whichever arm of Obamacorp has it just ain't talking. Either way, we don't have it. But that doesn't stop me from trying to fill in what the Eastern Semitic account may have been based on what we already know of their cosmology and based on the Western Semitic, i.e. biblical version, that we have to go on. So the Lord God is probably Enlil, right? And the snake is probably Enki. What is actually being communicated in these interactions? I know this story loves to get allegorical to death, and hey, like, great for you. If you learn some lesson or gain some moral insight or whatever, that's, that's cool. But I'm trying to figure out the historicity. That's what I'm here for. The Lord God says they can't eat from the tree or they'll die. Can't eat the fruit of knowledge, which is just a heavily entendre laden. <laughs> Anyways, the snake says they totally can and not only will not die, but they will become like God instead knowing both good and evil. So they eat the fruit, and literally the only thing that changes is they, they notice that they're naked. Suddenly their genitals have some significance. And consider what we just heard about their creation in a test tube from Homo sapiens nibiru and sperm and Homo habilis egg, possibly, potentially, as ancient astronaut theorists confirm. They're hybrids. And what makes a hybrid? What makes a species not another species? I'll stop it with the obnoxious rhetorical questions and just spell it out. It's the ability to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. It's why a horse is not a donkey and a mule is neither. They could make these Terran hybrid workers, but they couldn't make them self-replicating, not without Anki doing some tweaking. Or maybe they could do it and didn't want to, Anki did it anyway, and Enlil, realizing that he had a potential trouble with Tribbles situation on his hands, 
evicted them from the compound. And I do think that's what's being described, if telephone-gamed and behind some euphemism. The fruit isn't the only one. There's also the knowing. It's an extremely common euphemism for sex across the entire ancient Near East, and one that even shows up later in Genesis during all the begats. You know, so-and-so knew his wife and begat, begat, begat. So, there you have it. I wish we had a Sumerian original for the last bit, but I think we can see how the biblical story fits, and how it's pretty obviously describing real events, basically how they actually occurred. Nah, you, you decide that for yourself, if you believe it or not. Sitchin said that running into the word Nephilim in Genesis 6 was what got him wondering. For me, it was the flaming sword which revolveth, placed behind Adam and Eve to keep them out of Eden. Sounds like an awesome weapon, and even as a kid, my first thought was to wonder at what what the ancient authors could possibly have been trying to describe. And you know, maybe this is a tangent, but again, personally, I am, I am a man of faith. I've just never understood the idea that this kind of theorizing is somehow blasphemous or could debunk God. It seems, that idea seems to underestimate the majesty of the architect and master of the universe. Like, of course there can be space aliens and God, who do you think made the space aliens? From God's perspective, all of us are just basically fictional characters, moldable and fungible at will. He's not going to be a character who shows up in the story unless it's something really, really special, because he's the author. Anyways, that's, that's all I've got for today. Hope you, hope you enjoyed. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Support me over on Patreon or on my website, churchoftransphobia.com. Peace.